In the ancient world, people believed that divine beings lived in faraway places, the depths of the sea, the heights of the mountains, or deep under the earth. These places represented the spiritual realm, a world where humans don't live or belong. The most unreachable place of all was the sky, the heavens. It's the main way that the Bible writers refer to God's domain. They used the stars to refer to the spiritual beings. In Genesis, God creates them to be signs of seasons and to rule the day and night. Their glory reflected the transcendence and power of God. They parallel the humans, who are created in the image of God, to rule the whole earth as his hands and feet, echoing his wisdom, love, and creativity. Since the heavenly host was commissioned to govern aspects of time, you'd almost expect them to play a role in governing the human realm, especially since it exists within time. Further through the story, this seems to be the case. Among the host of heaven were the brightest stars, who held on the longest as the sun rose with the morning. These were called the morning stars, or the sons of God. Throughout the Bible, these titles become synonymous with high royal status and rulership, especially over the nations. God allows these beings to participate in certain decisions. They serve as what the Bible calls the divine council. In 1 Kings, the divine council meets before the throne of God to help orchestrate the downfall of the evil king Ahab. In Daniel, God and the council decree judgment on King Nebuchadnezzar for his hubris and merciless rule over the nations. They appear numerous other times throughout the story. Why did God make a council to help make decisions? Why did he create us? Love. He wants a family. He created the host in heaven and the humans on earth to share in his rulership of creation. His family wasn't perfect. Only God is perfect. He never asked us to be perfect. What he wanted was loyalty. But only a few chapters into the story, something awful happens. A member of the heavenly host undermines the created order. Ezekiel and Isaiah tell us that this created being wanted to rule above every ruler, even the creator. So he persuades humanity to betray God. Deceived, the humans seize life according to their own definitions of good and evil. But true life could only come from the author of life. They had turned away from him. As a result, they lost access to eternal life. They were exiled from Eden, and their deceiver held the power of death. All humanity would now eventually die from mortality, but God promises that one day a human will arise to defeat death and evil at its source, but he would also be wounded by it. After their betrayal, God still wants a relationship with humanity. Again, he commissions them to rule the world in his image. But the humans want to create their own identity and rule God's world on their own terms. They rebel, again. They built a city called Babylon and a huge tower to reach into the heavenly realm. This city becomes a symbol of the world system and rebellion towards God, both on a human and spiritual level. God passes judgment. The divine council bears witness. Humanity is disinherited, their language divided, and their nations scattered. Deuteronomy tells us that at this time, God placed a number of the sons of God as spiritual rulers over the nations to watch over them. Paul explains, God did this so that the rebellious humans could seek him and still feel their way back to him. He still wanted a relationship with the humans, but their heavenly rulers rebel and become so corrupt, it causes damage on a cosmic level. The nations begin worshiping them, following them in wickedness. These corrupted rulers are the dark princes in the book of Daniel, who rise up against the angel messenger. Paul calls them the rulers and powers of present darkness. Psalm 82 is a spectacle of God passing judgment on these rulers before the divine council. Moses tells us out of all this chaos, God chose Israel to be his representative among the nations. He invites them into a covenant partnership. Through them, he would reclaim and restore the nations. But Israel spirals into rebellion and begins giving allegiance to the gods of the nations. Eventually, they become so corrupt that God exiles them to the kingdom of Babylon. By the time of Jesus, tribes of Israel are still scattered abroad. The ones who returned home from exile are under the rule of Rome, the latest manifestation of Babylon. The spiritual rebels had continued to spread darkness and chaos, but the promised human had come. God himself, the author of life in human flesh. He would deal with evil at its source and receive all rulership and authority, both in heaven and earth. By his death, he condemned and overcame sin. The author of all life broke the power of death through his resurrection. 
by his sacrifice, he has invited us all into the inheritance of eternal life and rulership in a new heaven and earth. All he asks for in return is faith, or as Bible scholars put it, believing loyalty. The powers of darkness have lost, but they haven't been destroyed. They're still at work in the world today. They're the inspiration behind human suffering, division, and depravity. Our battle isn't against other people. The real enemy is the darkness behind the scenes. We engage in spiritual warfare by reflecting Jesus through the way we live and by spreading the gospel to the world. The day we put our trust in him, our allegiance changed. We are no longer of this world. We are infiltrators. This is all an oversimplification of the story, but we're not done yet. Our next video is about a class of spirit beings that serve as God's heavenly throne guardians. 